So what kind of a two-dimensional defect could we, <clears throat> could we have in, in a crystal? So first of all, what what's two dimensions mean? Well, you've seen, uh, you could plot x and y, and if you take the product of those, you know, you get an area. Um, so <clears throat> two dimensions means we're talking about an area. And what's an area? Well, another name we, we have for an area sometimes is um, surface, right? In fact, uh, a free surface is uh, you know any surface of a material that you, you touch with your hand. You touch the top of your desk, and that's a free surface. And in fact, that is um, that is a an imperfection because if you're say you're touching a piece of aluminum or some metal, well, you've got inside the material, you've got um, atoms in a regular repeating arrangement. They're in a, in a crystal. It's an organized solid or ordered solid. And so there's all these bonds going off. And I'm not drawing all, I'm just drawing you know, some, some atoms in a simple cartoon sketch here. But then all of a sudden, what do you have? What do you have out, uh, you know, out here? You've got air. That was an air sound. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. So, what well, that that makes this a free surface, and because it's a disruption in the regular repeating arrangement of atoms, you think there should be an atom here, 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 here. Oh, there's no there's no atom there. And and in terms of the atom itself, in fact, there's there's you can see there's a, a missing bond there, isn't there? There's a missing bond. Sometimes we call them unsatisfied bonds or <clears throat> oh, and we'll leave it at that. It's just missing bonds, and it actually elevates the energy of a, of a free surface. A free surface is at an elevated energy. Um, elevated, that should be elevated energy. In fact, you, you, you probably know this because you've, you've no doubt observed, perhaps if you're sitting inside, um, and it's, uh, what am I drawing? It's raining outside and you're looking out the window. Isn't that a beautiful window? There's some curtains. Okay. And what do you see on the window? Well, on the window, you might see drops of, of, of water, rain, right? I should label that so you know. Those are drops of water. They're water drops. Well, what happens if you see two drops, say, and one of the drops moves down under, under gravity and touches the other. You know that what will happen is they'll actually form one larger drop. Okay, I'm going to shade that in for you so it gets some three-dimensional three appearance to it. That's supposed to be another drop. It's supposed to be one larger drop. Larger drop. And this is two smaller drops. So you've observed this happening that you know that the two drops, as soon as they touch each other, they'll form one larger drop. And what's the reason for that? Well, sometimes you say, oh, it's surface tension. It's, and, and that, that's, that's not bad. I mean, it certainly describes the pull on the individual molecules of water. There's an attraction between them. We can discuss that later. But if you just look at the energy um, of the two scenarios here, this has got actually, in, with the two discrete drops, has a higher surface area to volume ratio to volume ratio when they exist separately when it forms one small drop it's a smaller surface area to volume ratio and so there's a smaller surface energy and I follow smaller surface area and because the free surface is in an elevated energy the single drop has a lower energy overall for the system smaller surface area Okay, and so that's why you see two drops forming, come together and forming one. In fact, that's why if you heat up a metal, the size of the crystals in it, the grains, will increase. But um, that's for another another discussion. So we know that a free surface is at an elevated energy. Well, what about um, an internal surface? So to look at an internal surface, we'd usually call that an interface. 
uh, I'll, I'll introduce another term that we use in, in this specific context here. But we want to look for an internal surface. So what I want to do is I want to say, well, let's look at the atoms inside a metal when it's molten. Molten means it's in the liquid state of matter. And so sometimes when we want to indicate that we're looking at um, the microstructure, what the atoms look like, we, we draw um, we draw a little circle as if you're looking through a microscope perhaps. And so let's say in there we've got a bunch of atoms. Okay. And so I'm drawing these atoms. There they are. And if it's in liquid state of matter, there's quite a bit of energy. And so the atoms have a bit of velocity to them. They're moving around quite a bit and there's a fair amount of space between them and they're disorganized. There's no long range order to these atoms. So then what you do is you decrease the temperature. You remove energy from the system as heat. And again, what we're going to do is I'm going to sketch a little circle there so you know we're looking at the microstructure. And, and what happens is a few atoms might bump into each other just kind of randomly. There's another couple of a few atoms coming together. And I'm doing this very much as a cartoon sketch, but you can imagine they might be forming their crystal structures. And, you know, we've learned about FCC, face centered cubic, so they might form a, some kind of a crystal structure. <clears throat> and then not all of them are in solid yet, still pretty, pretty warm. So there's some of these things that are starting to form these little crystals. Okay, I'm just drawing those little green dashes to show the kind of the direction of contact or the structure of these things. And then these other, the, the other atoms are still zipping around in there in the liquid state. So we have two things, right? We have, we have solid here, solid crystals. And then we have some atoms that are still in the liquid state. And so then what, what happens if we continue to decrease the temperature? Well, the crystals are going to get bigger. The crystals are going to get bigger. And so I'll try to draw those same Ones. And forgive me, I'm not drawing um, the same sum total of atoms in each of these sketches, but the concept is hopefully clear. So the, I'm trying to draw these same crystals, like this this crystal over here I'm drawing now, and it's getting bigger, okay, and it's following the same crystal structure, whatever it is, we're just treating it as a simple square lattice at this point, but it's getting bigger, and then this this crystal right here has to get bigger and it's got the same orientation. I just randomly picked an orientation because it randomly nucleated or randomly started to form this grouping, this crystal, and it's and it's getting bigger. And then there's still a few atoms that are in the liquid state. And they're zipping around, they've got some bit more movement to them, and the other ones are starting to form crystals. And you, you can perhaps see where I'm going with this. We continue to drop the temperature down and we get low enough that it's what we would describe as being completely solid, what does the system look like? Well, this atom, this crystal here is going to get bigger. But it's going to get bigger according to the same, uh, in the same lattice or the same orientation, same crystal orientation as it had previously. But then this guy that I drew over here, right, he's getting bigger too. He it could be a she. I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess these things don't have gender, but well, today they do. This is a she. This is a he. I don't know. Um, I'm getting myself in trouble. Um, and it, it, so they, they get, what happens? <laughs> they bump into each other. And this this one over here, this guy. Okay, this guy is is uh, growing and getting bigger. And it's got its own orientation, and where it runs in, bumps into this one, there's some atomic mismatch. It doesn't line up quite right. There's not quite enough space there for an atom in either crystal, uh, perhaps. And, and so you start to get these little boundaries. Maybe this guy grows a bit more this way, and, and, and <clears throat> what you end up with are these things we call boundaries between the crystals. So if I kind of I highlight that for you, you might see it goes somewhere through there. And those things are crystal boundaries.
Um, but in the in the in the context of, of solids, we, we usually don't use the term uh, crystal. Instead, we we call them grains. So these are grain boundaries. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll describe in uh, another video how we can consider now the movement of a dislocation. Say we had dislocation moving along through one of these crystals. Well, what has to happen when it encounters the grain boundary? In fact, I'm going to do it right now. Well, it's got to change direction. Okay. It might have to overcome a little bit of um, a mismatch. This plane might not line up exactly with this one. Uh, it's got to perhaps encounter and deal with some, some strain um, at the grain boundary. And so the grain boundaries present an obstacle to dislo dislocation movement. And we know an obstacle to dislocation movement leads to an increase in strength. And what's this one specifically, this mechanism called? It's called strengthening by grain size reduction. Because if you get the grains smaller, you'll have more grain boundaries and a higher strength. 